but today I want to show you some of my favorite go-to ways to spice up your metal songs. Tip number one, harmonizing lead guitar parts in diatonic thirds. This is a pretty simple thing that you can do to really kick your lead lines up a notch for fast, speedy guitar licks. Diatonic thirds are the jam because they really hold together at pretty much any speed. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like right now. I like to call this one the Iron Maiden method. It's super simple, really easy, and basically foolproof. Right now I'm using my favorite Easy Mix lead patch, the Ola Epic lead sound from uh, Metal Guitar Gods 3. Here's the little lick that I'm gonna show you how to harmonize. Nothing special. It's uh, in the key of E minor. Actually, my guitar is tuned down a whole step, so technically it's D minor, but we're gonna treat it like um, we're in standard tuning. The first thing that you have to do is figure out what key or scale you're using because otherwise you won't know what notes to use. All we're gonna do is take this sort of contour, the melodic shape, and scoot it up two scale tones, two notes within the key of E minor. So we're just gonna go, and then we're gonna play the same melodic sort of contoured shape, still only using the notes of E minor. So therefore the harmony part is going to sound like this. So if we play them together. Now, if you do that and it sounds kind of weird in the context of the song, you might want to try going down a third rather than up a third. Once again, we're going to do almost exactly the same thing, except we're going to go down instead of up. So starting at the note that the part starts on, we're going to go down two notes within the key of E minor. We go one, two. And then we take that same melodic contour and we fit it to the key of E minor. So it sounds like this. So if we play those two together, it sounds like this. White hot fire. Tip number two is about getting a lot of mileage out of the same idea. So you might come up with a riff or a musical idea that you've got for your song, and then you might think, okay, now I need a ton more because I can't just have one riff in a song. And that's kind of true, but you wanna think about it like this. If you have too many different ideas in a song, it can get way too crazy. It's, it doesn't sound cohesive or coherent. It just sounds like a bunch of different ideas all thrown into a blender with, uh, with no direction. And that's called riff salad. So you want to avoid that, but you also want to avoid the opposite extreme of that, which is to have a really boring song with pretty much just one riff that doesn't change. Uh, that's obviously just as big of a problem. So I'm gonna show you how to take a single idea and vary it in a couple different ways so that you can really stretch it out throughout a whole song and keep your listeners' interest without creating riff salad. Check it out. All right, so let's say you've got a riff, and I do, and it goes like this. Perfectly serviceable, techy kind of riff. The main thing that we're gonna focus on is the ending. I like to vary the ending of the riff because the first part is gonna be the thing that's the most recognizable and then the next time the thing comes around again and they hear it again, they, their brain goes, oh hey, I remember that, that thing was cool. I wanna hear it again. And then they're hearing it again and then all of a sudden the ending is different. Just a little variation. It doesn't have to be worlds different. And actually I think it's better if it's not because if it's completely worlds different from the way that it was the first time, it's not so much a twist on the idea as it is just something completely out of left field. So the last thing that happens in this riff is this thing. By far the easiest and I think coolest thing to do is to just rhythmically vary it without changing any of the notes because then it's still super familiar but it gives you just this little bit of a surprise, a little bit of the pull in the rug out from under under your feet. So I'm just gonna move like one or two notes from where they sit in the bar and create a variation like that. Let's see what I can do. Oh, that's cool, all right. That was literally 100% identical to the last one, except that the ending was different. So if we put it all together and hear them one after the other, you can hear how it 
messes with your expectations, basically. Now here it is with both parts together in context. So that's a pretty simple trick for getting a little more interest and excitement out of a single idea. All I did literally was just change the rhythm of a couple notes. I didn't change the pitches at all. So try that out on one of your riffs and let me know how it goes. Another easy way to stretch out that same riff is to just play the exact same thing in a different key. It gives you way more mileage out of exactly the same thing. So now this is just that exact same riff, but I've shifted it up a minor third. I had to sort of relocate some of the notes on the neck, but for the most part, it's pretty much the same. So here's what that sounds like. So now let's listen to them one after the other and we can hear how it sort of ratchets up the tension throughout the course of the riff. Even just those two simple variations are enough to get a ton of mileage out of the same idea. So try it on your riffs and let me know how it goes. Tip number three has to do with the drums. So for any given riff or part of a song, the drummer has the option of interpreting it a number of different ways. Um, it could be half time, full time, double time, anything like that. Uh, lots of different kinds of grooves that he or she can use to make the part feel a certain way. The main things that you're gonna to wanna to think about when you're choosing what kind of drum parts are gonna go in which part of the song, you wanna think about things like where the snare drum sits because that's gonna probably most strongly affect the feeling of the groove of a part. Is it hitting on two and four? Is it hitting on one and three? Are you doing like a D beat or like a power metal kind of a thing where it's like every other eighth note, you know? Is it gonna be blast beats? All those things are really gonna very strongly factor in to what the part feels like. What I like to do is anytime a part comes back, rather than just doing the exact same beat to it every single time, maybe the last time that it happens, you either just make it go faster or you make it go slower. It's extremely effective. It'll make the part hit really hard because it's still the same part that the listener is expecting, but you've also played with their expectations a little bit it's something familiar, but also slightly different. I'm gonna show you how I do that right now. When you're thinking about the overall form of a song, the structure, you typically have a chorus that repeats several times throughout the song. Even if it's not a proper chorus or a, a verse in the sort of traditional sense, you might have parts that repeat and come back throughout your song. One very powerful trick is when that part comes back the last time, you have it completely different from what it was the first time in terms of the actual drum feel. So let's say the first and second time it happens in the song, maybe the first, second, and third, depending on how many times it comes back, it sounds like this. Kind of a super fast power metal up-tempo kind of a thing. The last time it comes back, you're expecting that again. You, you hear it coming back around, you know it's gonna come back to this part. But now we're doing it, I think this is quarter time. We've stuck the snare a quarter as many times as it was the first time, so check this out. So that's a huge sound, a huge change. It's less about the specific exact way that you do it and more about just having some kind of a pattern interruption. You've set up an expectation and then you change it just enough to mess with people's expectations and give them a nice surprise. You can do it the other way around. You could have it the halftime or quarter time beat throughout the song and then at the end speed it up. That's also a really cool surprise. Songwriting is partially about these kinds of techniques and tricks, but I find more than anything else it's about trial and error. So of course I can't tell you which uh, beat you should use for which part of your song. That's gonna vary completely depending on what kind of music you make and what it, what it is that you like. You're gonna have to just try a couple of these things and figure out which one fits best for the song that you're writing. 
Tip number four is also about the drones. Another super easy way to create just enough variation from part to part within a song, even if you weren't to change almost anything else, you can get plenty of really solid, very interesting variation from part to part by changing what the drummer's power hand is doing. The drummer's power hand is just the one that's keeping time throughout the beat. So either the hi-hat, the ride, the crash, or a china. China is probably the most brutal one. You know that when you hear that coming, it's uh, time to die. Sometimes also a floor tom. Uh, that's a cool one, especially for like intros and outros. If he's playing on the hi-hat the whole time, even if the beats are really, really different, it's not gonna feel that different from part to part. It doesn't feel like the song is building or growing that much. I'm gonna give you a couple examples of what that sounds like right now. Any drummer worth their salt is gonna be doing this intuitively already, but it really helps as a songwriter for you to build it into the drum part from the beginning to really give whoever is learning the part an idea for what you want it to sound like. And the power hand is really gonna determine a lot of the feeling of the drum part. Of course, having a real drummer to do this is the bee's knees, but this is a songwriting video and I really like to use Superior Drummer 3 when I'm uh, writing songs because really when you're writing songs in this day and age and you're sort of recording it into a computer, you're doing pre-production, you're making a demo and you want it to sound at least as good as you possibly can. And Superior Drummer 3 sounds ridiculously good. And of course using program drums when you're writing I think is ideal because you don't have to play the drums yourself or hire somebody to come in and do it. And you can do stuff like this. For example, I'm just gonna grab the power hand and I'm gonna drag it to where I want it to be and that's it. Now we've changed what the power hand is doing. So now we've taken the same beat, the same part, and we're just moving it through a couple different power hand sounds. We're gonna start with the hi-hat and then the crash. And then over here we go to the ride and I've sort of doubled up the ride part so it's hitting twice as many times because that's a sound that I really like and I think it sounds a little weak for this particular part if the ride is going half time. And then finally we're gonna take this last one and we're gonna drop it on the china. So here's what the same beat sounds like with just the power hand changed. So that's a ton of variation just by moving what the power hand is doing. And this is something that it's a little bit subtle compared to like completely changing everything, but it gives enough variation, especially like in the middle of a part, changing it from the first half to the second half, something like that. It's just enough of a variation to keep it interesting, but not so much that it's completely out of left field and crazy and changes everything. Tip number five is about the bass. The bass is incredibly important in any song of any kind but especially in metal where it provides so much of just the sonic feeling of the song that if you don't give it the proper attention, it could go as far as to absolutely ruin the song. But I kind of feel like a lot of people play it really safe with the bass and a good, I don't know, 75% of the metal songs that I hear these days has a lot of the bass just following the rhythm guitar very, very closely, if not completely, exactly 100% one-to-one. I think that you can really, really do a lot better than that. And one really easy way to do that is anytime that the chord instruments in the band are playing big, ringing out chords uh, with a lot of space, I see that as an opportunity for the bass to add a very distinct rhythmic flavor to the whole part and really fill it out and give it a lot more personality than if it were to just kind of ring out with the rest of the instruments. I'm gonna show you how I do that right now. So here's an example. I've got these chords, they're just ringing out. Real simple. These three chords, basically. So, what I'm gonna do, instead of just playing these sort of following the guitar ringing out chords, I'm gonna add some rhythm to it. This is especially useful when you've got these sort of things that just 
go and aren't very busy because then you can make the bass a little bit more busy. Uh, it won't work 100% of the time, but this is definitely something worth trying if you have a part like this. This is using possibly my favorite easy mix patch of all time, the Ola Feared Bass, also from Metal Guitar Gods 3. Brutal. That gives you obviously much more interest, much more rhythmic variation and interest than it would have been had I just hit big fat ringing out bass notes. It's very important to note that I didn't actually change any of the notes that I was going to play. None of the pitches changed, just the rhythms and the way that I played it. So this just shows you how much variation you can get out of just changing the rhythm and adding a more interesting rhythmic figure to this same idea. Tip number six is potentially the most ignorant of the bunch, but that might also be why I like it so much, because it's simple and very effective. When all else fails, bring back the riff, but slower and lower. 